In this course, we'll be doing a deep dive on a very specific microcontroller, the PIC32MX795F512H. That's a number I will be saying a lot. Now, this is a microcontroller manufactured by a company called Microchip, but a lot of the microcontrollers from many different manufacturers work in the same way. So when we do our deep dive on this chip, you'll be able to apply that lessons to chips from STM32 and TI and Atmel and all of, it, all of the other big manufacturers. Let's uh, decompose this part number for a second. So the PIC32 is the family of 32-bit microcontrollers from Microchip. The 32 means that it's a 32-bit uh, processor. So all of the instructions internally are doing 32, uh, take 32 bits to store, which is a big number. Um, we can compare that to say the PIC uh, 16 series, which was one of the first PICs. That was actually an 8-bit processor. Uh, there's the PIC uh, 24 series, which is a 16-bit processor. The PIC 33 series, which is also a 16-bit processor. So actually, PIC 32 is the first one that kind of makes sense. Okay, uh, the MX is uh, one of the first families of PIC 32 microcontrollers that came out. It kind of describes the specific CPU core that's in this PIC32. Since then, there's uh, the MZ and the MK and the MM series of PIC32s, so they keep expanding on those. The 700 series PIC32MX is a specific uh, set of peripherals and memory within um, this particular PIC. So there's a PIC100 series and 200 series. We actually focus on that chip in my class ME433. Then there's a 300, 400, 500 series, and 600 and 700. The 795, um, so the 95 is specifically kind of how much flash memory there is. So there's a uh, 775, which has a little bit less flash, so it costs a little less, but you don't get to store as much uh, program space. And then the 512 represents how much um, uh, usually RAM there is, although this particular chip will be using as 512k flash and 128k RAM. So this number represents kind of like um, how much memory you have in general. The smaller that number, probably the smaller amount of memory there is on your chip. And finally, the H represents how many pins are on this chip. So this chip comes in a 64 or 128 or larger size. Um, so depending on if you want more pins to do more functionality, you can get a larger physical chip with more pins. So this is the smaller of the uh, sizes they offer, only has 64 pins. So we can think about the PIC32 MX700 series as all being very similar, just varying in how much memory uh, any particular chip has. And you might think, uh, well, we're going to start with this chip, which is one of the largest chips in terms of memory. It's a little bit more expensive than the chips that have less memory. So we'll prototype with this to experiment. If we wanted to make a product, we would simulate how much code we would actually need to make, so how much flash would our chip need to have, and how many variables would we need to have inside of this code. That would simulate how much RAM we need, and then we would pick a specific chip with that much memory uh, to save money, because the more memory on the chip, the, the more uh, die space it uses, the more expensive that chip is. And we don't want to waste money buying a chip with more memory than is necessary in a product. But for now, we'll be using this chip, which has kind of the, the most uh, amount of memory, so that we can experiment. <clears throat> okay, we're going to look at uh, the architecture um, of this chip. See, what exactly makes it, you know, a PIC32 versus some other kind of microcontroller. Um, then we're going to look at the peripherals. The peripherals are, what can this chip do? Does it have specific pieces of hardware inside of it to, say, generate PWM or uh, talk UR? Uh, what, what makes this PIC32 more than just like a general purpose chip? Um, and then we'll talk about memory. How is the memory organized inside of this chip? Uh, the first two, we're actually going to start with the data sheet. Um, and we'll scroll around the PDF because a lot of what I'm going to talk about here is really how do you look at this data sheet, which is a very large document, and boil it down to the important parts. Uh, then we'll come back out and we're going to draw a big picture for how memory um, is assigned inside of the chip.
So I googled uh, PIC32 MX795F 512H. Um, I found the data sheet from uh, the product page on Microchip's website, and I downloaded this PDF. Um, we can see it has 256 pages, so that's quite large. But this is even just the data sheet. So the data sheet doesn't go into the detail of everything this chip can do. The family reference manual is the bigger of the two uh, PDFs that Microchip provides, and that one has something like 4,000 pages. So this is just the kind of the rough introduction to this chip at 256 pages. Uh, we can see that probably all of the 500, 600, and 700 series uh, PIC32 MXs are so similar that they've been all combined into this one data sheet. That can sometimes make this a little hard to read because occasionally there'll be an asterisk next to something that says, oh, this only applies to like the 700 series or something like that. Uh, and then also keep in mind that the data sheet is often used as um, also like a sales pitch. So some of the things we're going to see on this particular data sheet kind of like are trying to make us interested and want to buy this chip. Uh, the family reference manual is really where we can dig down and figure out exactly how it works. But we'll get a lot of information from here. Okay, so on the third page, we're going to see this is basically the sales pitch. Um, they're calling this a high-performance uh, microcontroller that has USB, CAN, and Ethernet, and is 32-bit. Uh, okay, so 32-bit is um, kind of like, you know, the cool thing in microcontrollers these days. 8-bit um, microcontrollers meant that um, the uh, memory that was passed around inside of the CPU always had 8 bits. And so the instructions had 8 bits. And um, if you wanted to do something more complicated, like add two 32-bit numbers, it took many clock cycles to pass around a 32-bit number because uh, it, you know, it took uh, four transfers of 8-bit numbers to do that. So the 32-bit is basically saying, hey, we're able to do all of our math in 32 bits at a time. Uh, so most of our math can happen in a single clock cycle. Um, and then the instructions that we have are also 32-bit, which means that we can have lots of, lo lots of different interesting instructions, uh, meaning that the assembly instructions, not the C instructions, but there could be a lot of these assembly instructions. Now, of course, we don't have 32 bits worth, but it means that they can play tricks where within a 32-bit uh, instruction, they hide other bits to do other things and speed up some performance. So 32-bit just generally means, hey, this is going to be a chip that's um, good for crunching numbers and running fast. Now, not um, every microcontroller has a USB peripheral, a CAN, or an Ethernet peripheral. So these would be specific pitches here to say, hey, if you want to make a device that plugs into a computer and talks USB, um, this chip can do it. Not every chip can do that. Um, Ethernet is very special. Uh, that's a high speed peripheral and uses a lot of pins and a lot of memory. So this is going to be a, you know, a, a nice chip for talking to computers and things on a network. And then CAN is a special kind of communication that you might not be familiar with. This is what a lot of industrial robots use and uh, the communication within a car between all the microcontrollers are in the car use CAN. So we've got here, you know, a, a pretty high quality 32 bit microcontroller that has a lot of different ways to communicate. Um, specifically, it has a uh, RISC core. Um, we're not going to go into the details of the different kinds of CPUs, but um, that's like a you know keyword a lot of people pass around. It's a RISC type processor. It's made by the company MIPS, and we'll talk about what that means. Uh, we'll also eventually get into what a uh, pipeline stands for. The fastest frequency it runs at is 80 megahertz. Okay, that's a good uh, piece of information to know. Um, so every clock cycle takes one eighty millionth of a second. Um, it has a uh, single cycle multiply and high performance divide unit. So when we're doing math, it'd be great if you know adding or subtracting two numbers only took one clock cycle. Uh, division, of course, is always uh, harder to do. Um, so it's saying here that you know we can still do division pretty fast too. Okay, um, what about the microcontroller features? Uh, it's running from 2.3 volts to 3.6 volts. The industry standard is 3.3, so we'll be running at 3.3 volts. This uh, set of you know family of microcontrollers offers um, flash memory. Flash is where your program is stored from 64k to 512k, and then there's an additional little 12k area uh, to store your uh, bootloader. We'll talk about what that means. Uh, RAM that's where your variables live, so from 16k uh, to 128k. 
and it's pin compatible with most of the PIC 24s. So before the PIC 32s came out, we had this whole generation, maybe five or ten years worth of PIC 24s. So the PIC 32 is really just an evolution of PIC 24. Okay, peripherals. So peripherals are the add-ons that make the chip powerful. Uh, how do the pins interact with the world? Uh, this is nice. Atomic, set, clear, and invert operations. Atomic means that this operation can happen in one clock cycle. So when we want to set bits and the bits change things in the world, we can do that uh, 80 million times a second. Not every microcontroller offers atomic changes. Um, so that makes something special about this pick that it can run kind of super fast like that. Well, we won't get into the DMA, but DMA is another way to manipulate memory, um, kind of in parallel to what the CPU can do. So I don't think in this course we'll get to using DMA, um, but know that the CPU can run on one piece of memory while the DMA is running on another piece of memory, kind of like you have two CPUs, but the DMA is a little bit more specific running one like specific task. Okay, then we have, um, uh, we have UART, SPY, I2C, we have all these peripherals, and peripherals are the things that make our chip powerful. So it's dedicated hardware within the chip that can specifically do something like generate PWM, so that we don't have to spend time with the CPU saying turn the pin on, turn the pin off with very specific timing. Within the PWM module, we can say, I would like this frequency and this duty cycle of square wave to come out, and I only have to tell it to do that once, and then it just does it forever, and it frees up me to have the CPU do other things. So the peripherals are kind of like set and forget um, uh, specific kinds of tasks. And then, of course, we have an analog to digital converter, which most microcontrollers have. This one can specifically read up to a million times a second, on 16 different pins with 10-bit resolution. So the next few pages on the data sheet, uh, they list out all the different uh, PIC32s in this family that you can get and what peripherals they have based on how many pins they have, what package it comes in, so that's how you solder it, um, and then how much memory you get. And if we went to the uh, Microchip Direct website, we can actually see how much each of these cost. And you'd see that um, you know the base one with the lowest amount of memory is the cheapest, and as you add more memory, you add you know a dollar or two here and there until you get to the one with the most amount of memory. So that's why in uh, industry you would figure out exactly how much memory you need uh, for your device, and then pick the microcontroller with just that much memory so that you save money. Okay, so that was 600, 500 series, 600 series. Here's the 700 series, and we'll be using the uh, PIC32 MX795F512H, that's this one here, um, comes in 64 pins, 512K flash, uh, 128K RAM, it has one USB module, one Ethernet, two CAN modules, it has five timers, um, eight channels of DMA, six UARTs, um, so if you needed to talk to six different devices over UART, you can do that, uh, three SPI, four I2C, 16 pins, uh, for the analog to digital converter, and so on. So when you look at this, this is like, wow, there's a lot of things that this chip can do based on all of these peripherals. There's going to be a downside. There's only 64 pins. So how do we get all of that stuff into 64 pins? That's where a limitation will come in. Now we can see exactly what the chip looks like, what the pins are, and what the pins do. So let's find our specific chip. Here we go, the PIC32 MX795F512H has the exact same pinout as the 775, uh, 256H and, and 775-512H, uh, so those are the same chip with just less memory. Uh, uh, so this, this chip uh, has 64 pins, and we can see some of them are shaded gray, meaning that they're five volt tolerant. So this is a chip that runs at 3.3 volts. If you were to apply 5 volts to one of those pins, you'd, you might be worried about burning it out, right? Because it's a 3.3 volt system. So some of these pins are, can read 5 volts, uh, where others cannot. So we have to be a little bit careful when we're interfacing to things. If they're capable of generating more than 3.3 volts, we need to make sure we apply it to one of these shaded pins so we don't burn it out. Um, when we look around at what these pins do, uh, VDD is a power pin, so that's where 3.3 volts will be applied. VSS is ground, uh, and you can see they're kind of scattered around the chip. The chip 
itself runs internally at 1.8 volts. We never see 1.8 volts on any of the pins, but the CPU itself is running at slightly less. And so that means it has an internal regulator and that needs a capacitor to stabilize itself. That's the VCAP pin. So a capacitor goes there. And if we read that pin, we would see 1.8. We'll never see 1.8 ever again. Uh, what else do we have? The OSC pins, that's where the oscillator goes. So this chip is going to run at 80 megahertz, but we don't supply it with 80 megahertz. We supply it with an oscillator uh, that could be a variety of frequencies. And then internally in code, we tell the chip how to take that oscillator and turn it into the 80 megahertz to run as fast as we can. Okay, let's just pick a, another pin here and figure out, you know, what does it do? So pin 16 is um, what we would refer to as pin B0. So if we were just using this as a general purpose input output pin, we would refer to pin 16 as B0. B0 can also be this functionality CN2. So CN stands for change notification. So this is a pin that can be set up to watch for events like a button push. And uh, when that uh, voltage changes can tell the PIC to, hey, stop what you're doing and go pay attention to this pin. So we don't have to sit there and read the pin all the time. We can set up this change notification functionality uh, to tell us to do that automatically. And we can see there's lots of other change notification pins. So that's one of the peripherals and eventually we'll learn how to use it. Okay, it also has this functionality PMA6 and CV ref plus and V ref plus and AN0 and PGE D1. So here's the downside of this kind of chip. It's got so much functionality in it that they have to double or triple or quadruple up on functionality on a pin. So if we wanted to use this pin for change notification, that means we also could not use it for AN0, which is the analog input zero. Um, so we have to decide when we're building our circuit, what's more important to get a change notification button input or an analog input. And maybe we can switch an analog input to pin 15, which is AN1, and then use this pin for CN2 instead. That'll quickly um, become difficult because, for instance, pin 46, OC1, int 0, D0. D0 is a general purpose pin. Int 0 is an external interrupt pin, and OC1 is a PWM pin. We love to use PWM to control things like the brightness of an LED or the speed of a motor. We also love to use int 0 as a pin that detects things uh, like button pushes or... Um, things that are a little bit like more elaborate than button pushes, but still uh, need to attract the attention of the chip. Um, so sometimes these uh, functionalities that double up uh, uh, get in the way. We'll come back to this uh, graphic a lot because we'll be choosing pins um, to do certain functions and we'll have to you know, double check to make sure we're not doubling up where we can't double up. Okay, then we can see the other pinouts of all the other chips. Eventually we get to chips that are so big they split across a page. And then this is the BGA version of the chip, meaning that it's a grid of pins underneath instead of just pins on the side. So these get quite difficult to solder. And obviously you'll never fit one of these chips on a breadboard without a breakout board. Our next video will describe the NU32, which is our specific breakout board. Let's spend a second looking at this block diagram, and we'll come back to this um, often uh, because it's um, kind of key to how this chip works. So on the sides, we can see the peripherals. These are the special functions that the chip can do. So here's the change notification peripheral, the timer peripheral, the PWM peripheral. Um, inside of the chip, where is the code actually being executed is here, the MIPS uh, 32 M4K CPU core. So Microchip actually didn't design this part of the chip. A company called MIPS did. You probably never heard of MIPS, but you have heard of ARM. So ARM is a like a competitor to MIPS. ARM designs CPUs and licenses them to manufacturers. So Apple licenses the ARM processor and even actually Microchip licenses the ARM CPU. And they actually then implement the CPU and then surround it by the peripherals that make uh, interacting with things more interesting. So when we are using the GCC compiler, the GCC compiler is specifically targeting the assembly instructions that a MIPS32 can do. Um, how does the MIPS32 core interact with these different devices? Well, it has 32 bits of communication to the bus matrix, and the bus matrix can then talk to everything else. So you can consider this like 
uh, 32 wires, 32 parallel wires that go out and can talk to, for instance, the data RAM. The data RAM is where your variables live. 32 bits can be transferred um, from the bus matrix into the data input of the core. And 32 bits of information can travel from the instruction uh, request to the flash memory and then come back out uh, into the core. So what happens when we power up our PIC? The CPU says, I need something to do. I will ask for an instruction um, 32 bits at a time to come from flash. Flash will then load an instruction into the CPU and that instruction would say, I would like to go read you know, some address in RAM and then do something to it. So the next instruction would say, okay, I will uh, go grab some data through um, the 32 bits into data RAM and I will load it into the core. And then maybe I'll add two numbers together and then I'll save them in RAM. And then I'll go get my next instruction from flash, which says, now let's go grab two variables to RAM and divide them. So then the next instruction would go grab it from, from data RAM, load it into the core, do the division, then load it back into RAM. So the CPU is kind of like the brain um, and then the bus matrix is, um, you know, the, the nervous system sending and receiving data out through the flash memory, the, the data memory. And occasionally they'll say, oh, now I need to go read a pin. So from the bus matrix, I will go through the peripheral bus clock to system clock to a pin on one of these ports, read the value, put it into RAM, analyze it. And so the data travels in and out of all of these arrows. We can notice that there's uh, two different clocks. There's system clock, so everything kind of on the left is running at system clock. That's 80 megahertz. And then on the right, we have other peripherals, which maybe take up a lot of power. And when we're not using them, we don't want them to use so much power if we're on like a battery system. So we can slow them down be by having them on this PB clock instead of system clock. So PB clock doesn't necessarily have to run at 80 megahertz. It can run slower uh, to conserve power. The last kind of interesting thing here, well, we'll come back to this a lot, but let's right now talk about uh, this data transfer from flash is 128 bits wide into a prefetch module which communicates to the core with 32 bits at a time. So what's going on there? Why is this data transfer uh, 128 bits wide? So that's four 32-bit instructions per clock cycle happens here. Um, why not just have 32 bits like everything else? The problem is that flash memory, this is where our instructions are kept, this is when we write our program and it gets stored into flash, is slower than 80 megahertz. So when you make a request from flash memory and say, I would like the instruction at address 4, like tell me what to do, uh, it can't respond instantly. It might take a few cycles because flash memory can't uh, be accessed and read that fast. Or it could, but it would be more expensive and this chip you know, doesn't have the more expensive version of that memory. So this is where things kind of get complicated. When the CPU says, okay, I'm gonna start at address zero, go give me the instruction at address zero. It would have to wait two or three clock cycles before that instruction comes back from flash because flash is just a little too slow to respond. Um, but most likely after it's done with instruction at address zero, it's gonna say, well, now I need the, ad the instruction from address one, go get that for me. Uh, the prefetch module says, okay, you just asked for the uh, instruction stored at address zero. I will go to flash, but I'm not going to grab the instruction at address zero. I'm going to get zero, one, two, and three. I'm going to get you know the first four instructions, and they will come back in you know one transaction. But that will take you know two or three clock cycles because flash is a little slow. Then they will be stored in this local prefetch module. That's like uh, just a little bit of memory, and it will pop over the first instruction to the core, and the core will then act on that and say, okay, I want the next instruction. Prefetch will say, good, I've already got it. Here it is. And that will happen in one clock cycle. And so the prefetch will try to run ahead of the CPU and try to guess at what is the next piece of uh, information it needs to get from the program flash memory and grab four of them at a time so that they're already kind of preloaded and available at 80 megahertz. So that means our code's always going to be a little bit hard to say how fast does it run. Um, if the code is running linearly, the prefetch module is probably doing a good job of staying ahead of the CPU uh, and always preloading the next instruction so that the CPU never has to wait. But if, in, if something happens like an if statement, 
where if the if statement is false, we need to jump somewhere else into the instructions and grab some other instruction. Prefetch can't really predict that. So the prefetch is going to hope that all of your if statements are true. Um, and if they're false, then the CPU is going to have some, you know, every once in a while, small clock delays. So that's something interesting uh, we can see in this diagram. We'll come back here to discuss other things at other points as we discuss other peripherals. The rest of um, this data sheet would go into how some of the peripherals work. So we can see all of these different peripherals have their own um, chapter, like here's the comparator, which is some kind of op amp inside of the chip. This is only like two or three pages on the data sheet, and here, in this case, I guess it's only one. If you wanted to learn more about how the comparator works, chapter 25 of the Family Reference Manual is probably 20 or 30 pages on how this works. Uh, so we'll be going back and forth between the data sheet and the Family Reference Manual to figure out exactly how some of these peripherals work. Towards the end of a data sheet are typically uh, other types of information. Um, so the electrical characteristics of this chip, um, uh, typically what happens under different temperature conditions, other, other, uh, on other voltage and current conditions, uh, interesting uh, you know, maximum uh, current that you can draw from any pin, and then maximum current that the sum of all the pins can do. And if you ever you know, abuse the chip by trying to source too much current or apply too much voltage, you know, that's when the chip can break. So that's this kind of information here. And then packaging information, uh, what do the chips look like when you buy them? This is uh, very useful to know when you're planning on making your own breakout board, um, when you're making a printed circuit board, what should the uh, you know copper pads look like on that printed circuit board? We're not gonna do any um, design of printed circuit boards in this class, uh, we'll do that in the next class. So if you find that interesting, take any 433. Um, and then a revision history, so what has changed in this chip? This chip's now probably 10 years old, so they've slowly changed things that were broken. And then parallel to this data sheet is also what they call the errata, which is another PDF that goes through and describes, oh, you know, this is what we said should work, but there's a little bug. And so occasionally you have to look at the errata data sheet to see where are the bugs. So, okay, that was a lot of information from the data sheet. We'll jump back in there as we start going through the individual peripherals. Let's talk about one more thing. How is memory arranged in this chip? Uh, it's a 32-bit processor, which means that we can address 32 bits of uh, memory. The address's space goes from 0 to 2 to 32 minus 1. Um, but when we summed up the memory that this chip has, 128K of RAM and 512K flash, some other little bits here and there, it's nowhere near 32 bits worth of memory. So um, the architecture is going to take advantage of that to try to speed things up occasionally. So this is the first time we'll draw what we call a memory map. So this is a memory map. And uh, we'll think of it as like a stack of note cards where the bottom note card has address zero and the top note card has the maximum address that we can have in a 32-bit system, which would be the address 2 to the 32 minus 1, since we started at 0. So that's something like 4 billion. So there's 4 gigs of potential memory addresses on this chip, but we know that it doesn't have nearly that much memory on it. Um, so how does the memory that it does have get organized within this stack? So for this specific PIC32, um, the first set of memory is the RAM memory. Remember that RAM is where we store our variables. This particular chip has 128K of RAM. So this address 0, this um, that would be the first address in RAM. The last address in RAM would be something like 128,000. Um, then, for some reason, there's a gap. The next set of memory um, does not immediately start at the end of RAM. It, there's a gap, and the next address that is useful, and this is a big number in hex, uh, 0x... Uh, 1d and then five zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, so we could uh, calculate that out and see that it's a number that's much bigger than 120k. And that is where our flash memory is located. 
and this chip has 512k flash. So that address plus 512k would be the end address of the flash region. Okay, so what does this mean? Inside of our chip are all these transistors, um, and one big block of transistors is made up RAM, and the addresses of those RAM starts from 0 to 128k. Um, another big set of transistors will store our flash memory. Um, it doesn't exactly line up next to the RAM, and in code, what we need to know is um, how do we get to an address in flash? It has a very specific address that the memory controller will guide to it. So when the CPU says, give me address, you know, 1 billion, um, the memory controller says, I know exactly what transistor to go to to read the 1 or 0 that are at those bits. Um, so physically, this memory map doesn't exist in the chip. But what we need to know are what are the addresses uh, to know where um, on the chip to go to read all this memory. So RAM and flash, those are the important ones, where our variables live, where our instructions live. Um, then there's going to be another gap. And we'll have space for the um, special function registers, SFRs. We're going to talk a lot about SFRs in a future video, so we won't have to describe it too much now. But the special function registers are specifically variables inside of our chip that are connected to the pins. So if we change a bit in a specific special function register, which is you know some memory address in here, that might make a pin turn from 1 to 0 or 0 to 1, depending on whether the bit is a 1 or a 0. So RAM and flash are you know very specific to our code. Um, the SFRs are the things that are tied to the real world. OK, another gap. And we get uh, 12k of boot area. So if we want our chip to be able to self-program and we don't want to put our bootloader in flash memory and use up some of the flash memory, we could try to stick it in that boot area. We're not going to worry too much about that. We have another gap. Um, and then the very last four words. So this space is four words. Uh, and a word is a 32-bit number. Um, those are special bytes of memory called config bits. Also called dev configs. Uh, so you'll see it dev uh, CFG. The dev config bits are kind of special, special function registers. They're the ones that tell the chip when it first turns on, uh, like what speed should it run and what are the voltages it expects. and uh, what peripherals should be on and, and off of all the like special peripherals. These dev config bits are only settable by a device called a programmer. They can't be changed in the code itself. So when the board is soldered together and the programmer puts the first program onto this board, it specifically tells this chip, oh, did you know you've been soldered to an 8 kilohertz or 8 megahertz uh, clock chip? That's very important for the chip to know so that when the code says, OK, I would like to run at 80 megahertz at full speed, and later on I'll run at 20 megahertz to reduce power. It still needs to know the, the kind of like what has been soldered to it to be able to generate those things. So the dev config bits are um, like hardware configuration stuff that the code never needs to rechange, but it will need to know to be able to run properly. So special, special function register config bits. And there's not that many of them. There's only uh, uh, four times. Uh, uh, so the, <laughs> the amount of memory this has uh, uh, would be uh, four memory addresses times four each. So there's 16 addresses for these. But everything's arranged in 32 bits. So there's four sets of 32 bits of these dev configs. OK, so uh, let's stop there for this. Uh, uh, video and on the next one we'll talk about how is the specific NU32 microcontroller breakout board uh, interface to this specific pick.